Is this thing on? Welcome back to Big Mouth and fancy seeing you here in June. I very welcome my friends and especially my enemies. Come in, sit down, no touching. I don't do the touching. And welcome to Saturday's edition of the DCEU Daily. And if you're feeling charitable, please smash the subscribe button and the like button. And of course, please follow me on Twitter. Please at Movies a TV Mad and see what's going on now. At Movies TV Mad stroke Mad Mickey because I'm absolutely balmy. Wow, what a free weeks it's been in the DCEU Snyder community. We started off with a beautiful thing, a beautiful event from Zack Snyder himself. He sat there on Vero and did a live director's um, shot by shot commentary on Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice. Wasn't that beautiful? Wasn't that amazing? Wasn't that positive? But we can't stay too positive in this community. Nah, that's boring, isn't it? So all of a sudden, a seven-second video was dropped of Ezra Miller. The first I heard of it was the fandom menace doing plenty of videos, beginning with that Star Wars girl pretty much saying that Ezra Miller's just ruined his own career, blah, blah, blah. So I saw the video... And it was funny, and it was obvious it was just a prank. Then we later found out that it was um, an April Fool's joke. Hilarious. Obviously, the lad isn't cancelled. He hasn't done anything wrong. But it was funny just to see all these prominent members of the Snyder community pretty much keep very quiet and keep on doing videos about it like they didn't blatantly know it was a damn joke. So that sums a lot of them up. And, I mean, like this week, seeing John Aaron Garza um, do a video on his channel about Andy and Fandom Wire. And then when he was invited onto Andy's channel, he quickly deleted that video. You know, things like that just show you where things are. And that, that doesn't mean that John Aaron Garza doesn't like, love Zach or love BBS or MOS. It just means that for a quick buck, we lose our morals, don't we? And, 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 and that's a shame. Um, then, of course, we had Andy's video and article this week pretty much saying that Warner Bros. would never work with Zack again and that um, we were never going to see the Snyder Cut. Really, really funny, really amusing. So we start off, as usual, with our movement right at the top and then it gets really negative. How do I feel about everything that's transpired this week? I have no feelings about it because it was all lies. All lies, all fibs, all BS, all bullshit. And anyone who's disparaged about what Andy did with Fandom Wire, and especially that crap they also did about MOS and BVS um, being kind, kind of deleted in the canon in the Flash Flashpoint movie. Absolute nonsense. And now I'm reading something else. Uh, People are confirming now that in Wonder Woman 1984, BVS is canon. Right, this is difficult because I've seen a 90-minute test screening of this. Keep on telling you this. It's not a brag. Just reminding you that I have inner knowledge of this film and what the future plans of the DCEU are. Now, let's just say that Wonder Woman 84 is actually set in 1984 and is not set in a world called 84. Right, let's just pretend. Let's pretend either or, right? Um, if it is set in 1984, I of course know, I know, right, okay, that's fair enough, but I know, it would be before BVS, wouldn't it? It would be before Batman v Superman. So how can Batman v Superman be canon in a film that though, where those events haven't actually happened? It's such a stupid thing. So it's a DCEU movie. This is the Diana and Wonder Woman. This is the continuation of the prequel, you know, leaping from the first Wonder Woman film, right? So, uh, that's that. Um, some cool pictures. Actually, I was going to say, you need to remind me by the end of this video to show you a great um, um, picture of Diana in her Get Wonder Woman Get Up, if I can. I've, I've screenshot the picture. But first of all, what we're going to do today, right, first of all, is read an article about Darren Afanosky. Darren Afanosky, Aronofsky, or how you say his name, wrote and directed one of my favourite films, and that was The Fountain, starring Hugh Jackman. Amazing film. You won't understand any of it, but it's amazing. It's a mindfuck. I really love it. So, after this article, there's another one from Screen Rant where they're talking to, well, they're not talking to, but it's an interview that Michael did, obviously, about his new film, and he's letting a lot of kind of DCEU bombs out. And he talks about his favourite moments from Man of Steel. Haven't read it yet. We're going to kind of premiere that together. So that's very exciting too. So let's go with this one. How Joe Chin, how sorry, 
How wacky, oh, I say the ocean, don't I? How wacky in Phoenix helped kill Darren Aronofsky's 2000 Batman movie? Not fair. We're going to read this and I'm going to tell you my opinion. Darren Aronofsky reveals how Whacking Phoenix helped kill his 2000s Batman movie. Coming off the debacle that was Batman and Robin, Warner Brothers in the early 2000s considered taking the Batman franchise in a very different direction. In hopes of putting a darker and grittier spin on the series, the studio turned to Aronofsky, who at the time was fresh off his acclaimed and very dark drama, Requiem for a Dream. Look, the man's a genius. There's no question about that. Aronofsky is one of the greats. And when you've got one of the greats wanting to make a Batman film with you, whatever he says goes. But we learn from what they did with Zack, Warner Brothers isn't tailored like that. Unfortunately, hopefully now, with Anne Sarnoff, things are different. And it is looking that way to a point. We'll see what the future holds there. Aronofsky's take on Batman would indeed have been a much darker interpretation of the character inspired by Frank Miller's Year One series with Miller himself actually coming on board to pen the script. Wow, how awesome would that have been? Unfortunately for fans of the incredibly intense and brutal comic book movies, Warner's eventually passed on Aronofsky's and Miller's Batman, which is very disappointing, actually. Christopher Nolan would, of course, eventually take over the franchise using elements of Miller's books to inform his Dark Knight trilogy. Financially, it was a great move for the studio as Nolan's films went on to break the box office. I love Christopher Nolan. I love his Batman films. But I think that Batman Begins was hardly setting the box office alight. Now, let me be clear. Batman Begins is my favourite Batman movie. Uh, but we've got to talk about things genuinely and honestly. Speaking recently to Empire, Aronofsky gave more details about what exactly happened to his own even darker take on Batman. And it turns out the story involved an actor who, could eventually, who would eventually make his way to the DC Universe as an entirely different character. Aronofsky explained... The studio wanted Freddie Prince Jr. I've read this before. This is so funny. Freddie Prince Jr. I actually talk to Freddie a lot on Twitter. I know a lot of people don't like him, but he is hilarious. But anyway, the studio wanted Freddie Prince Jr. And I wanted Whacking Phoenix. I remember thinking, uh oh, we're making do two different films here. That's, that's a true story. It was a different time. The Batman I wrote was definitely a way different type of tape they, than they ended up making. It's safe to say Phoenix's Bruce Wayne would have been very different to the version the clean-cut and black Prince Jr. would have delivered. Eventually, the studio found sort of middle ground between dark and traditionally comic bookish with Nolan's films starring Christian Bale. Can I just say something before we go on? Christian Bale, there's no difference between Joaquin Phoenix and Christian Bale. It's nuts. These studios don't understand acting or mentality or storytelling because Christian Bale was coming off American Psycho which was one of the most scariest, fucked up movies. It was funny, but it was also scary, right? The way he was acting. I remember that Warner Brothers initially were afraid that kids would be scared of this Batman, and they were thinking of making it an R-rated Batman Begins. Yeah, that's what they were thinking. So there was no difference for me. Joaquin Phoenix is an amazing actor. Christian was an amazing Batman as well. But I don't understand the mentality on passing on Joaquin. Christian Bale as a more down-to-earth Wayne. Many fans today consider Bell's Wayne to be the best take on the character. I think it is. So it's hard to argue that Warner's made a mistake in embracing Nolan's vision of the franchise. I don't think it was a mistake to embrace his vision. It was a mistake to spit out and chew um, Darren Aronofsky's vision. When you've got someone as intelligent, emotionally intelligent as well as Aronofsky, in writing a story and directing a story, you've got to be nuts to protect that. You've got to know... In the end, it's going to turn out okay. <clears throat> but even though Nolan's Dark Knight films with Bale in the lead role eventually satisfied audiences and critics, it's still amazing to imagine what Phoenix's take on the Wayne would have been. I agree. Phoenix, of course, showed exactly what he can do when let loose in a dark and gritty version of a comic book world with his portrayal of Arthur Fleck. In last year's blockbuster Joker, would his version of Wayne have been similarly complex and disturbing? I think so. But again, let me stop again and say this. Um, Christian Bale's was dark and disturbing at all. Uh, did we see two different Batman Begins, Dark Knight and Dark Knight Rises? With Aronofsky at the helm and Miller um, penning the script, it's sh it, it sure Wayne, Wayne Batman would have been at least very conflicted and quite possibly outright nuts. So was Christian Bale's in places. 
which would have played perfectly into Phoenix's hands. Of course it would have done. Sadly, the world will never got, get to see Phoenix's Bruce Wayne. Well, actually, never, never say never in this industry, by the way. Anything's possible. Clearly, the studio at the time was scared away by Aronofsky's take on the character and by the notion of casting an actor like Phoenix, who at that point was not a bankable name in the lead role, for fans still longing to see a psychologically complex take on Batman. Perhaps Matt Reeves' upcoming <coughs> The Batman will deliver just that, with Robert Pattinson in the lead. Warner's is certainly more amenable now to the idea of a truly dark comic book movie than what they were in the early 2000s, as they've proved by releasing Joker and Man of Steel and BVS. Right. I think this is an amazing story, right? I just think this is just crazy, right? When you think about Miller's take on um, the Batman, his graphic novels, you've got you've got so many great takes on it from Miller. And I'm surprised when you've got a film that's going to be directed by Darren Aronofsky, who's a genius, as I've already said, and Miller. It, Frank Miller's a genius, a genius. This film would have been amazing, amazing, I tell you. And Warner Brothers, you really missed a trick. I've always said we need more comic book writers writing more live action content. It's really worked well with Jeff Johns. I know a lot of you don't like him in the movement, but at the end of the day, he wrote some amazing episodes of Smallville and he's done some good stuff out there in live action. The man can write. There's no question about that. And this would have been awesome as well. So to reject this because they didn't want a, such a dark take, for me, is a massive, massive mistake. And Warner Brothers, you need to do better in the future. But who knows? Who knows? In the next DC Black Label, it may not be Arthur Fleck that Phoenix is playing. It could be that version's Batman. Wouldn't it make any sense narratively, but it would be fun to see, don't you think? I love Michael Shannon's honest nature. I've just got a lot of time for this actor. I still think he's the best villain in a comic book movie of all time. When I think about all the early DC films I saw as a kid, like the Superman stuff and the original Batman stuff, um, Burton's Batman and all of that, I still think this guy, and even when you look at Heath Ledger's Joker, and when you look at villains in the MCU, this just not worth. I mean, are we going to talk about Thanos, a CGI villain, for Christ's sake? I might as well throw, you know, Doomsday into the ring as well from BVS. No, this is the best. I mean, to be honest with you, there's not really a lot of great villains in um, comic book movies, right? Um, but that doesn't mean I'm just saying this guy is okay. This guy, as Zod, was amazing. We discussed that yesterday. Michael Shannon reveals which scenes in Zack Snyder's Man of Steel were his favourite to shoot, and which ones he didn't enjoy quite as much. Released in 2013, Man of Steel introduced audiences to Henry Cavill's version of Superman. The, Superman, the superhero origin story was met with a divided response due to its grim tone, oh shut up, and violent subject matter. So what? Loved the violent subject manage, um, matter, and I loved the kind of dark tone as well. Still, it, it's nevertheless praised for its big budget spectacle and jaw-dropping action sequences. Shall I tell you what else it's actually um, credited for? Being a compelling emotional movie, which you people don't want to credit it for. But never mind, you keep going. Man of Steel also earned significant acclaim for its acting. In addition to Henry Cavill's groundbreaking performance as the legendary strange visitor from another planet, Michael Shannon's take on General Zod was also singled out for praise, even against Terrence Stamp's previous portrayal of the more warmongering Kryptonian in the 70s Richard Donner movies. Now, don't forget, Richard Donner only did Superman 1. He did Superman the movie. Now, he did do two movies, which he didn't complete the second one. I know we got the Donner cut, cut eventually, but ultimately, the one we saw originally was Superman the movie. In an interview with Screen Rant to promote his latest project, The Quarry, Shannon discussed his turn as one of Superman's deadliest enemies and how a big-budget science fiction epic compares to a movie like The Quarry. A slow-burn dialogue-driven modern West, Western, citing his theatre background as the root for his interest, Shannon slated that the, the dialogue scenes between Zod and Superman were his favourite to shoot, while the high-flying CGI action scenes were less fun to create. While General Zod's fights with Superman in, in Smallville and Metropolis were certainly exciting to viewers, the, the reason of the Man of Steel version of Zod continues to engage audiences is because of his relationship with Superman. 
That relationship is what drew Shannon to the role. He told Screen Rant, My favourite part of Man of Steel was the story and characters and the situation. In the midst of all the fighting and whatnot, when Zod is actually being very frank with Superman, you know, saying, this is why I'm doing what I'm doing. This is my job. This is what I've been through, you know. Those moments were where they connect with one another. Those are the moments that interest me. And this is why he did them so well. Michael Shannon. Actors like Shannon can pick and choose what they want. He's not the biggest A-lister, right? But in talent, he is an A-lister, right? So he picked this. And I, I've heard him say this before, that he was sitting on the bonus features and saying, you know, isn't it ironic that we're sending, you know, you know, pods out to see what kind of planets we can live on? And we're making a film right now about an alien coming to Earth, trying to turn it and Liverpool, the atmosphere of Liverpool for another planet. Isn't it ironic? And we're doing this all the time. And he, he, he basically says this as well. He goes, not only do we want to mess this planet up, we want to go and mess another one up. So the commentary in this film really interested Shannon. And I find that fascinating and fantastic. As for the actual fight scenes with their loads of stunt work and use of CGI visuals, Shannon was less interested in creating those particular scenes. I don't really enjoy riding around on a horse or shooting guns or acting like I'm fighting somebody, but I like doing scenes where I get to say interesting dialogue or listen to somebody else talk. When we were making Man of Steel, there were some fun sets, but on a lot of days you just go to the, to the green screen studio. That doesn't exactly get your heart pumping. It's really technical work. It's hard work and Shannon is the type of actor who prefers the simple pleasure of telling a story through dialogue and acting. Though he does admit to enjoying some of the fight scenes in Man of Steel. I mean, fighting is cool as hell, don't get me wrong. There were some really cool sets too. Like, like that scene where we have that big showdown in his hometown. And I blow up the gas station and all of that. That was pretty cool. I'm not sure if General Zod can take credit for blowing up the gas station. Was it him? Or was it him and... I, don't, I can't remember. I have to go back and watch it. I've only seen this film a hundred billion times. Since Man of Steel, Shannon has mostly shied away from big budget CGI heavy blockbusters. Instead, he chooses to stick with more character driven turns in films like The Shape of Water and Knives Out. He doesn't seem keen to return to the realm of superhero action, but with the right script and a rich, nuanced character like Zod, it's hard to imagine he wouldn't be willing to give it another shot. Michael was interested in doing a prequel Krypton movie with Russell Crowe, by the way, and I've mentioned that on this channel before. Um, that would have been amazing, right? So, again, Shannon just, you know, purring, you know, the love of acting. And I love actors who want to talk about acting. There's a lot of people who are uncomfortable. Joaquin Phoenix is uncomfortable about talking about why and how he's such a great actor and what it takes. I'm fascinated to hear these people talk. But, of course, when you're promoting a movie, it's, it's difficult as well. Isn't it? So great stuff there and always great to read and see uh, Michael's mentality to General Zod. I believe one day that um, he could return. Who knows? He may even appear in Zack Snyder's Justice League. Nothing's been mentioned, but he's not going to give us every Easter egg in his little basket. If he was the Easter Bunny, he would have to share them out for everyone, wouldn't he? So we will see. Finally today, I want to talk about the Batman. There's a lot of assumptions that the Batman is not part of the DCEU. Listen to me. There is no way anyone knows that. Nobody knows that. Nobody knows what's going on here. We don't know if it's a reboot. I mean, what's great about Matt Reeves, he hasn't told us. So he keeps the conversation going, which of course is fun for us YouTubers as well. But I believe this is the DCEU Batman. Don't forget, I mean, everything's going to be delayed now. So who knows when we're finally going to see this movie. But don't forget, if we were to see the Batman next year, which seems very unlikely now, who knows what's going to happen. Um, but if we were to see it next year, we would have already seen Wonder Woman 1984. The timeline's going to change in that film. Something's going to happen. I don't want to talk too deeply about that, of course. Um, so by then, of course, we wouldn't have seen the Flashpoint movie, but that's going to be part two of changing this timeline. So basically, he is the DCEU Batman. Is he a version of Batfleck? Is he a younger version? Is this a prequel? Look, nobody knows. But just to sit here and make assumptions and say, nope, this is a reboot. This is an offshoot movie. I think it's a DCEU movie. I think it's part of the DCEU. How that works and what happens there, we're going to have to wait and see and find out. But what do you think?
comment down below, like, share and subscribe. And of course, I'll be back with more DCEU Daily tomorrow. See you again soon.